Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be doing section 9.7, which is all about parametric curves and parametric equations. So the good news is that you've actually seen these things for a while, and in particular you've gotten some experience with them using sine and cosine. Um, but now we're going to generalize this idea and look at a more generalized class of curves. So let me pull up the slides. There we go. Oh, another cool thing is we're going to see a lot of a uh, lot of pretty pictures in this lecture. So stay tuned for that. Lots of cool things. And if you ever got to play with a spirograph when you were a kid, we're actually going to see how those types of curves are, are generated, which is pretty cool. All right. So here's the overview. We're going to get some motivation for what these things are, why we care about them, why we want to learn about them. Then we're going to get a definition and then we're going to look at a bunch of examples. Um, and I think there's a definition peppered in there as well. All right, so here's the idea. There are many functions and many curves that we want to describe that we can't write in the form y equals f of x. So remember that in order for you to write, in order for a curve to represent a function of x, it has to pass the vertical line test in particular, right? So there are lots of curves that don't pass the vertical line test, but we would still like to be able to work with them and investigate them and so on. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the other thing is there are a lot of functions that are either difficult or just really, really painful to describe when you use Cartesian coordinates, x's and y's. So we want to be able to get at those functions and those curves in a, in a more convenient way. And we're going to see that a lot in, in this chapter and chapter 8 and so on. Um, so the, here's how we're going to do it. The general idea is rather than describe the vertical change of a curve in terms of its horizontal change, in other words, let y be f of x. So in other words, plot the output of the function in terms of x, or I mean, put in x, plot the output on the y-axis, for example. What we can do is we can describe both the horizontal and the vertical change in terms of a third variable called a parameter. So in other words, rather than trying to say, hey, if you give me an x value, I'll give you a y value. Instead, we're gonna have a third variable called a parameter and that variable is going to essentially give us a point in the plane. So it'll give us both an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate dependent on this third variable. So let's see the definition. Um, suppose that x and y are given as functions of a third variable t. So in other words, what we're doing is this. We're going to let the x-coordinate be the output of the function f at t. And we're going to let the y-coordinate be the output of the function g at t. So we're describing horizontal and vertical behavior totally independent of each other, right? So these equations right here, these are called parametric equations, and t is what we call the parameter. And each value of t determines a point in the plane, just like so. There we go. So in other words, every point x comma y can be represented by f of t comma g of t. And this is essentially what a parameterization is. So curves that are defined in this way are called parametric curves. And yo, oh, there it is. And this pair is what's called a parameterization. It's essentially a way of telling us how to traverse the curve. That's the idea. Um, an intuitive interpretation is that you could think of this point as the position of an object in the plane at any time t. So it's kind of like, okay, at, a, at 10 seconds, where was the point? At 13 seconds, where was the point? At 15 seconds, where was the point? And so we can track the point that way using this new parameter. And the point can move anywhere we want it to move. All right, so let's talk about some examples. The, the cool thing is that Cartesian curves, ones that you've seen already, those actually are also parametric curves. So with the functions you've been working with since like algebra, for example, y equals f of x, that is a parametric curve. It's just that the parameter is x itself. There you go. Same thing if we were looking at uh, functions of y, right? So you've seen functions that look like this. These are kind of like sideways parabolas, for example. Um, those are also parametric curves. It's just that the parameter is y. There you go. Um, so <laughs> uh, like I had mentioned, um, wait, what do I say? Blank curves. Uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So one of the nice things about um, parametric equations and not being tied to that, that horizontal input is that we can describe more interesting curves. So in particular, planar curves defined by parametric equations of a third variable, they encode more information. They can encode the position of a point at a certain time. 
which is kind of cool. So we actually we actually get more information from this type of a parameterization. And when we want to indicate which direction the point is moving or the object is moving, we use a little arrow on the curve. So let me give you an example. Uh, let me draw this up here. So in the past, we've been dealing with lots of functions that look like this. And you've seen these for a long time. y equals f of x, a nice function. It passes the vertical line test. But in reality, there are curves that are a lot more wiggly and interesting that we would really like to play around with. So maybe even something like this. Whoa, there we go. That's a curve that you know we can imagine, we can draw, we can think about, we can work with. We want to be able to describe it mathematically. That's what we're able to do here. And if you'll notice, <clears throat> excuse me, if you'll notice that uh, when I was drawing it, the curve was being traced out in time. So as my pen moved across the screen, it would trace out that curve in time. So let me do another example like this, whoa, right? So in essence, there's like a starting point, there's an ending point, and there's a directionality to the curve. So we indicate that directionality with little arrows, like so. There we go. And that's the way, that's the, way the curve was generated. We basically started right here and ended right here. Um, those are called the initial and terminal points, but we'll get to that in just a minute here. Um, oh yeah, and this I'd already said before. So parametric equations allow us to describe the horizontal and vertical behavior independently, which is kind of cool. So let's see an example. Let's uh, sketch and identify the curve defined by these parametric equations. And what I want to do to start is uh, I want you to think about how you might try to draw this sketch immediately. Like, what would you try to do first to figure out what this would look like? <clears throat> All right, now say something out loud. What were you thinking in your head? What, what, what do you think you would try first? All right, now let's try it together. Uh, generally, if you're stuck with, and you don't know what to do with these types of things, you've got a function, you've got a formula for it, it's usually a good idea to plug in some points. So let's just pick some values of t, and we'll plug those values into the functions for x and y, and we'll see what points we get. So here we go. Uh, again, you can pick any values of t that you would like to test out. Generally speaking, um, picking some negatives and positives is a good idea. It's usually good to include 0, because 0 often gives us our initial point. So here's a table where the values of t were chosen to be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And all you have to do is take these values and evaluate your functions at that value, negative 2. So if we plug negative 2 into our function for x, we get 8. If we plug negative 2 into our function for y, we get negative 1. So now we have a point on the plane. And the point is the point 8, comma, negative 1. There we go. So when t is equal to negative 2, that's the point that we're looking at. And then we can keep going. So Take the value negative 1, plug it into x, we get 3. Take the value negative 1, plug it into y, we get 0. And then you can continue in that fashion. And then you'll get a whole set of points. And then when you plot all those points, you can connect them with a continuous curve to see what the curve would look like. And we get this. All right. So in this case, we actually got what's a sideways parabola, right? And you can see the arrows indicated. Maybe if I zoom in a little bit. There we go. Oop. There we go. Zoom in a little bit. You can see the arrows pointing the direction of travel right there. So when we plugged in negative 2 for t, this was the point we were given, right? Well, what was it? It was um, oh, negative 1 and 8, I think is what I wrote. Yeah, there we go. And then the curve traverses this way. We got this one, which is 3, comma 0. We saw that in the table. Then it goes this way, this way. And so all these points are like sample points in the curve. We just want to see where the curve is going, what, what kind of trajectory it's going to take. And there we go. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, down here, it's good, to, it's good to take a look at this structure right here at the bottom. Let me zoom out a tiny bit. So this right here 
Let me zoom in actually, there we go. <laughs> so that right there is the, is the point itself. So x of t comma y of t. And what I did here when I wrote this piece on the slides was I wanted to substitute x of t with its function, if it with its formula, and then y of t with its formula. So this point that you see at the bottom of the screen, I can't get it to like move up anymore. Um, that's just giving us the location of a point in terms of t. So it's really kind of nice because you can, you can just glance at it and see what the formulas are going to be. And this is something that we'll see again in the course, and you'll also see it when you get to Calc 2 um, and Calc 3. All right, so some other details here. Uh, for one, we can see the trajectory of the curve as t increases, right? So the curve is being built in this direction. <clears throat> and one of the cool things about getting comfortable with these is you can start to figure out how the curves should look without having to plug in points. So notice that the behavior in the y direction is linear. So I'm looking at this bullet point right here. There we go. So the function for y is a linear function, right? It's just t plus 1. Um, it's a line. So really what this is doing is this is just letting, letting the y values change in a linear way. But notice that the formula for the x-coordinate is quadratic. It's quadratic. So what that means is that the behavior in the x-direction is going to appear parabolic because the x-coordinate is being defined by a quadratic function. So the behavior in the x-direction is going to behave like a parabola, which is pretty cool. So you can start to like mesh these behaviors. You can say, you know, well, let the x-coordinate or let the x-value change this way, let the y-value change this way. What kind of curve do I get? Right? So it gets to be really, really fun. Okay, so yes. So now let's talk about eliminating the parameter. <clears throat> so sometimes what you can do with these curves is what's called eliminating the parameter. So in this case, what we could do is we can actually solve this equation for y. And that's what I'm doing right down here. If we solve this equation, I'm sorry, for t, we can solve the, the y equation for t. Now, if we solve it for t, we get this formula. So t is equal to y plus 1. Then what we can do is we can take that formula and we can plug it back in to x. So we'll basically put it into these, these placeholders for the input of the function x, right? And then when we do that, what we get is this result down here. There we go. So this is just me going through with that substitution. And when we do that substitution, lo and behold, we get a quadratic function a quadratic function in terms of y, right? So here we have x as a function of y. And what's happened here is the parameter has been eliminated. The parameter no longer appears in this equation. So we were able to eliminate the parameter and now we can write x as a function of y. And once again, it makes sense that it would have this type of structure because it's a parabola. <laughs> it's a parabola. So this is just a sideways parabola, kind of like the, the example I was mentioning a minute ago. Um, but there's one thing that we lost in this process. We lost information about the direction of the curve, right? So let me erase this for a second. There we go. When we look at this formula, x equals y squared minus 4y plus 3, we don't know anything about how the curve is traced out in terms of time, for example, right? So that information gets lost when you eliminate the parameter, that, that time information in some sense. OK, so overall, the process of solving one parametric equation for the parameter and substituting it into the other equation is called eliminating the parameter. Uh, it's essentially just a standard elimination technique. Now, the other thing is, oftentimes we want to restrict the domain of our parameter to some interval alpha, comma, beta, so that we can focus on local behavior. Right, alpha and beta look familiar. So <laughs> sometimes we want to restrict the domain to just like a, a closed interval. Don't let the curve go everywhere. So this is where we can get the definition of an initial point and a terminal point. So let's say we have parametric equations, x equals f of t and y equals g of t. So the x coordinate is a function of f, the y coordinate is a function, I'm sorry, <laughs> the x coordinate is a function of t, the y coordinate is a function of t, but now what we're going to do is we're going to restrict t 
to lie between these two values, alpha and beta, then the point f of alpha comma g of alpha is what we call the initial point. That's basically where the curve starts. And the point f of beta comma g of beta is the terminal point. That's the point where the curve ends. So starting point, stopping point. And the point f of t comma g of t will traverse the curve from f of alpha comma g of alpha to f of beta comma g of beta as t increases from alpha to beta. So this is essentially just tracing out the curve. All right, let's take a look at this example. So I'm gonna ask you all here, what curve is represented by these parametric equations? Think about it and then hopefully you say something out loud almost immediately. All right, I hope those look familiar. Yes, that is the good old unit circle. That is the curve of the unit circle. Remember the x coordinate is cosine and the y coordinate is sine. So this we've been looking at like the whole class, right? Since uh, I think the second lecture, we've been looking at this idea. So you've been looking at a parametrically defined curve for the whole course. <laughs> and the x coordinate is independently defined from the y coordinate. So uh, oh, there's also this really cool result. Notice that if we if we substitute these into the Pythagorean identity, we get x squared plus y squared equals one, which is the equation of that circle. <laughs> so cosine and sine have been telling us a lot about how to go around these circles, right? They're parameterizing the unit circle or a circle of any radius. If you want it to be the circle of any radius a, or maybe I'll say r, you just throw an r in front, and then we get r squared. Oops, sorry, this should be r squared, <laughs> r squared. So these parametric equations, those give you, th those are the parametric equations for a circle of radius r. And notice here that we're restricting the parameter to be from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 2 pi. So what that's going to do is that's just going to allow us to traverse the circle once. But if you uh, increase this number 2 pi, then you could talk about traversing the circle more than one time over and over and over, right? Because remember, the domain of these functions is all real numbers. But here we can restrict it and say, just go around the circle once. Okay, how about this one? Think about this one. And then get ready to say something out loud, too. What curve is represented by these parametric equations? All right, now say something out loud. What do you think it's going to be? All right, now let's talk about it together. So if you remember from before, changing this coefficient in here changes the, the, the frequency, right? That changes the period of the cosine and the sine function. So what that does is it makes the cosine and sine curve occur more quickly. So what this is really going to be is going around the circle again, but twice as fast, right? So now the period has been shrunk, uh, it's been cut in half, right? So now you're going to go around the circle sh sh twice as fast. And in fact, you'll go around it twice on this interval from 0 to 2 pi. So there you go. Same thing, same thing, but traversed twice as fast. Okay, now I'm going to go to Desmos, and I've got a whole bunch of examples on this, uh, this Desmos link here. So I encourage you to click on that go to that Desmos page and just honestly play around with some of the graphs. We're going to look at a bunch of the examples right now. So let me pull those up. All right, give me one second. There we go. Okay. All right. So hopefully you can see that. Let me double check. It's kind of hard for me to see. Yep. Okay. Nice. All right, so let's take a look at some of these. Um, a is just what our parameter is going to be. So A is going to be our parameter, and I'll explain it when we look at, it, look at one of these examples. So let's look at a fast circle first. And what I'm going to do is look at the, uh, the parametric equations. So just like we saw in the example, the fast circle, circle being traversed twice as fast, was given by the, the parametric equations cosine of 2t and sine of 2t right here. All right. So let's look at what happens when t goes from, here I just have 0 to 10. Now, this little orange dot, that's the point. 
that's the starting point of the circle, the initial point. Now let me cycle through A here and boom, right there. It keeps going around and around and around. So what happens here is the point just keeps traversing the circle. Okay, let me go here. All right, so it starts off right here. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Here we go, starts off right here and then goes around and around, oop, too far. Slowing my computer down with all this. Uh, okay, so look at this. Right around three, it's pretty close to ending up where it started, right? And in fact, if I were to put it right at 3.14, oop, 3.2, it just passes. Well, what happens between three and 3.2? Pi, <laughs> that's right, pi. And that's because the period of this curve, the period of this curve is, is pi. Because the period of cosine 2t two th two, two and sine of 2t is pi. So there you go, <laughs> the fast circle. Now, what's fun about these types of things is you don't just have to draw circles. You can draw all sorts of crazy curves. So you can let your mind go wild with this. How do you want the, ec uh, the, the, the vertical change to occur? How do you want the horizontal change to occur? Make up your own function and just play with it on Desmos. You can do it this way. Uh, just copy the copy the the structure that I have here. So this is just a point with the two parametric equations entered here, and then this t less than or equal to a part. What this is doing is this is just letting me trace out the curve. It basically lets it um oh what is it like it lets it like smear it out as I go along. So here's a cool example. This one is what's what I call a periodic parabola. It's just a parabola that gets swept out. So here we go. What happens when I change A? Oop. There we go. I want to keep it in. There we go. It goes up, down, up, down, up, and it bounces back and forth, back and forth. Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, starting here, it starts at 0, 0 because sine of zero is zero, so sine of zero is zero, and sine squared of zero is zero. And it goes up to the point one comma one, then it swoops back down, then goes up to the point negative one comma one, and then it just goes back and forth. All right? Now, some cool things. We, this really makes sense if you think about the parametric equations, right? Because the x-coordinate is being traced out in terms of sine, right? So the x-coordinate is behaving sinusoidally. And this is precisely what we saw in the previous section, 7.5 on simple harmonic motion, right? That's precisely what we saw. So the x-coordinate is bouncing around like this, but the y-coordinate is behaving parabolically. And so that's why in the y direction, it looks like a parabola. And in the x direction, it's just moving back and forth, <laughs> bouncing back and forth, cool stuff. Okay, now let's look at another curve. There's a whole bunch of these curves, so you can explore them. Uh, this one's called a, a Lisa Zhu curve. Bit of a funkier formula. It's four times sine of four t for the x coordinate and three times sine of three t for the y coordinate. Let's see what it looks like. It's starting here at the origin. Let me change a our parameter. Whoa, shoots out that way. Oop. Swooping around. Whoa, I think I should zoom out. Ooh, there we go. <laughs> Whoa, there we go. <laughs> and then it repeats. Okay, I got to see that again. Let's go back to the beginning. All right, so at zero, zero, or when A is zero, we're at zero, zero. Now let's just, ooh, look at that. <laughs> Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Oh, and then it repeats. When does it repeat? Oh, right around 6.3. Hmm. What number is near 6.3? 2 pi. <laughs> 2 pi. All right. So that's one curve. Let's look at another one. And again, you can, you can play around with these all you want. Open up this page on Desmos. You can mess with them. You can make your own. Just use the same structure and just play around with the x and y values and see what you get. Okay, here's another curve. What are the, what is, what's the formula here? cosine of t times 1 minus cosine t for the x-coordinate, and then sine of t times 1 minus sine of t for the y-coordinate. Let's see how it looks. Oh, looks like i got to zoom in. 
All right, let's try that again. How does this look? Whoa, there we go, zoomed in too far. Oh, that's an interesting one, check that out. It's got like a really small loop and then a really big loop right there, right there. Nice. So there's a cool one. All right, let's see, go back to zero here so we don't spoil any surprises. Okay, let's do another curve number two. Oh, what's this one? A of T, or I'm sorry, A plus sine 5A, A plus sine 6A. Oh, looks like this one goes a little bit quickly. So maybe I should move slowly here. Here we go. Ooh, what is this one doing? Ooh, I gotta zoom out. Oh, I remember this one. This one traces out, almost looks like a signature. Check this out. And then off and off and off it goes. <laughs> Keeps going. It's got some, notice it's got a, it's got a periodicity to it, right? It repeats it's precisely because the sine curve is periodic. So you get a repetition in there, a periodicity. Um, there's another thing we can, we can look at just by looking at the structure. Notice that the, the X coordinate and the Y coordinate both have our parameter just alone, right? So that means if we were to ignore the sinusoidal behavior, the sine of 5A part, and just look at this part here, this is going to look like the, the coordinates A comma A. In other words, the X and Y coordinate are the same. So in other words, we're on the line Y equals X. So maybe I'll even just add that right here so you can see. Like what does y equals x look like? Boom. And our curve just follows that line, but we're adding in some additional behavior as our curve wants to go along that line. We're adding in the behavior termed, uh, determined by sine of 5a and sine of 6a, right? So that's why it's like going along that curve and the sine functions are where they're giving you the wiggliness, right? <laughs> Pretty cool. What if I do sine of 5a, sine of 5a? What does that do? Oh, sorry. Uh, da, 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 6a. Okay, let me do this. 5a. Oh. They just cancel each other out. Check that out. Of course, I didn't change the location of the point, but there you go. Okay. So let me put this back to six. Actually, that was kind of cool too. Check out that, <laughs> check out that curve. So you can mess with, them, mess with this and get some pretty interesting things. Okay, I won't get distracted any longer on that one. Let's get distracted with a, a different one. All right, how about another curve number three? Oh, let me hide this. So this one starting out here, and then as I increase A, ah, oh, this one looks a little bit like, a, like an asteroid almost, A-S-T-R-O-I-D asteroid. It's almost got three triangles kind of swooping around. Very cool. What about number four here? Oh, number three looks like this. So the, the, the formulas are getting more and more complicated here. So now let's look at the other one, number four. Here we go. Oh, what is this one? So like I said, again, let your mind run wild. You can get as crazy as you want with these, with these functions and just see what the curve would be. Go have fun with it, make it up. All right here, let's see what this one is. Uh, oh, this one looks like it has more points. Ooh, more and more and more. Does it repeat? There it goes, now it repeats. So this is why I mentioned spirographs at the very beginning. So if any of you ever had a chance to play with spirographs when you were a kid, they're basically these gears with holes in different positions on them. And you had another gear that you would put around and then you would just use your pencil and let the gears guide the, the trajectory of the pencil. You just went around and around and around in the, with inside these, these gears and these circles. And it would trace out pretty pictures just like this one. So <laughs> how do you actually design those toys? Well, you use this mathematics right here, the mathematics of parametric equations and parametric curves. All right. Now let's look at the cycloid. So the cycloid is a really interesting curve and it starts with a circle. So this is just a, a circle with radius one and maybe you've actually seen this in, in your own experience before. Maybe if you're ever riding a bike and you run over a puddle, 
you can you can see this type of thing. But the the curve that defines a cycloid is this one. It's essentially the curve that this orange dot is going to trace out as this circle rolls along the x-axis. So here we go. Imagine the circle rolling along the x-axis. What's this little orange dot going to trace out? There we go. Goes like that and then boom, hits the ground again. Let me move out a little bit. Rolls and boom, hits the ground again. Let me zoom out. Rolls, boom, and then can keep going. So this curve right here, this is what's called a cycloid. This is what's called a cycloid. A very, very interesting curve. And this is how it's drawn out. And I, I guarantee this is the type of thing you might have just seen if you're ever like riding a bike, right? So if you ride a bike over a little puddle, uh, the location of the little the, the splashes that your wheel will leave are these these points right here. And the, the trajectory that the wet part of your wheel will take is this. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Okay, so that one is the cycloid. Uh, let's see what the next one is. The conchoids of Nicomedes. Come back here. All right. Oh, yeah, these ones. Okay, so these ones are really interesting. Oh, that's right. Okay, I have a, I have a change for B. Um, so this one actually involves two different parameters. So let me draw the first one with the parameter B equals negative 1.4. Here we go. So this one actually, like, shot down went to negative infinity and then now it's coming down from positive infinity oh and then it repeats interesting okay now notice this uh, this asymptotic behavior makes sense because there's a tangent function involved right and the tangent function is involved with the uh the y coordinate so that's why we're getting vertical asymptotic behavior because of that tangent function now what's interesting about these these conchoids is when you change the other parameter b it changes the shape of the curve in an interesting way. Oop, let me make it positive. Oop, there you go. See how you get these little, let me zoom in. These little bubbles. And then they drift away. So there's, a, there's, there's an interval where if the parameter lies within that interval, you get a loop. So notice right here, right at one, we get a cusp at the origin. And then when I go down to zero, we get a big loop. And then right at zero, we just get the circle. <laughs> right at zero, we get the circle because if B is equal to zero, or let me go back. Hey, hey, there we go. If B is equal to zero, look at what happens to, to the point, right? Look at what happens to the equations. This disappears, this whole tangent term disappears, and you're left with cosine comma sine, which is the unit circle. All right, so then if B goes below, we get that little loop again. And then at negative one, we get a cusp. There it is. Pretty cool, huh? Another interesting curve. Another interesting curve. All right. Okay, so that being said, I encourage you to go and play around with these and make up your own and just see what you can do. But the main idea is that the x and y direction are being independently determined by a third parameter t or whatever label you want to give it so we've actually seen this before actually hold on let me go back to hold on let me rearrange some windows give me one second here mm -hmm. wait, wait 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 hold on hold on come here come here wait there we go there we go okay all right, so <laughs> um, that's it, that's it. So let's play, uh, and like I was gonna say, I encourage you to play. Uh, these, these curves are really, really fun. The big idea is just that the X coordinate and the Y coordinate are determined independently by a third variable T or whatever you wanna call it. Um, we've been calling it theta, we've been calling it alpha, we've been calling it gamma, a bunch of different things. So um, I'll stop rambling, I'll leave you with that, and I'll see you next time.